Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Rohan Gray, an assistant professor at Willamette University College of Law who participated in the recent U.S. congressional hearing on digitizing the dollar. The two discussed their shared belief in the importance of privacy-preserving digital cash and then get into where they disagree, such as their opinions of crypto overall. They also discuss the differences between public money and private currencies and how Rohan is for Monero existing and competing but believes it can never and how we should never want it to replace government-controlled fiat. Monero Talk starts now. All right. We're live. Or not live. Recorded. But we're, we're all live. Rohan, thanks, Matt. Thanks for coming on. Greatly appreciate thanks, yeah. it. Thanks for having me. I know we had some technical difficulties here. Thanks for uh, putting up with this. So like I was say saying before, when we initially tried this, um, normally we have like a little intro before the show. Uh, and you know, uh, but in this instance, I I'd like you to kind of introduce yourself a little bit, just because I, I was, I learned about you through a recent congressional hearing uh, on CBDCs, particularly, you know, the uh, potential advent of, of a U.S. Fed coin. And I was intrigued by some of the things you said, particularly your concerns about privacy and the need uh, to make sure if, if a Fed coin were created, that uh, privacy, the concept of, of privacy were, were, were innately tied into it and uh, cash-like properties. And uh, on Monero Talk, that that's really what we're always most concerned about. So I wanted to bring you on to, to talk about that. And I started researching you and realizing there's, you know, there's a lot more to you than those few statements uh, and realizing we perhaps don't agree on everything. Uh, I think we certainly agree on, on those on those particular points. So uh, without further ado, please, please give me, uh, you know, the, the best uh, summary of yourself that you possibly can. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm I'm uh, a legal academic. I teach at a university in Oregon called Willamette University. Uh, I teach contracts, securities, business organizations, and a lot of my research focuses around the legal design and regulation of money uh, and banking, uh, as well as issues around sort of broader macroeconomic policy like full employment and equity, things like that. Um, I got into this stuff uh, sort of unintentionally. My father was a scientist and then became a lawyer who spent a fair bit of time working on regulations around telecommunications and broadband licensing and things in Australia in the 1980s when that was the sort of hot new telecom area. Um, I always was interested in sort of internet law related issues. Um, but I got into this mostly because I was a musician first and was interested in intellectual property and copyright, sort of didn't really believe in those kinds of uh, ways that we've structured our culture and our you know, knowledge and information. Uh, and when I got more into money, kind of more, more from the sort of global financial crisis and what the hell do we do with this planet where we're dealing with side of things, uh, it became clear that there was a kind of connection around the sort of digital currency, digital technologies, where on one hand, it was sort of about the economics and about the sort of justice and those things in terms of sort of distribution and who gets how much money and for what. And then on the other side, there was this sort of larger question about the sort of techno structure and the data and the architecture and how there were sort of underlying politics to those questions that also need to be addressed that a lot of people who maybe care about those other questions don't spend as much time focusing on. So that kind of naturally pushed me to digital currency work. I do some work with the ITU on standard setting. I've helped on various pieces of legislation like the ABC Act, the Stable Act, the Public Banking Act. Uh, yeah, and you know, this is sort of where I focus mostly around public money 
and around the sort of how to design a system to be, you know, universal, accessible, equitable, but also respecting people's privacy and civil liberties and those kinds of things. Okay. So, uh, like I said, I, I think it's fair to say we agree uh, on the need for cash like properties in uh, any type of cryptocurrency or, uh, you know, CBDC. Um, we need to make sure that we, you know, maintain those properties, right? Is that, is that fair to say that, you know? You yeah, know. yeah, at the very minimum, yeah. Um, and then I guess what, I'm, what I was trying to understand in, you know, in doing some research on you is where you, I guess you stand on cryptocurrencies in particular. Are you yeah, so this, this goes back to that kind of economic question. You know, I, I look at a lot of the way that money and commerce work today as, as sort of fundamentally legally constructed space. So, you know, even before you get to the money, there's property rights, there are contracts, there's accounting rules, there are courts, there are, you know, questions about how we interpret certain meanings of words and things that all require a supporting legal system. They all require a society with institutions and people in authority to adjudicate these kinds of things. Um, money within that has had always a particularly intimate relationship with public governance. Um, and to me, at least, when it comes to the sort of future of privacy and money, the important question to start with is, what kind of money are we looking at? What are we trying to deal with? And there are a lot of people in the crypto space who I think are doing really interesting work, including people at Monero, really important technical work. They're motivated by a lot of politics and goals that I share, but they have a view about how money works that is, in my opinion, wrong. And because it's wrong, they come up with a diagnosis and then pursue certain solutions that I think are misguided. Now, maybe I'm wrong, you know, we'll, we'll see. I'm not out here trying to sort of lock everyone up, but I do think that there is a really big difference between public money, money that is created by public authorities, that is, is connected to the legal system, that is recognised and acceptable in payment of uh, public and private obligations and private currencies. I don't think they serve the same function. I think there's a role for complementary and private currencies. I support them. I support particularly ones developed by communities as an explicit sort of social intentional community with, with explicit rules of governance and things like that, um, and particular stakeholders and things. But I, I think when it comes to the social function of money, public money occupies a, a qualitatively different place. And whatever we do there, whatever the fight is there, however we win or lose that battleground, will define everything else. There won't be space outside of that to meaningfully resist. And so when it comes to, I think, the causes I share in common with a lot of people in the crypto world, I think the real battle is the stuff that we're doing around the future of digital public money. And that there are interesting tech innovations that can come from these private initiatives. But also, when you start from a, a tech design spec or a political constraint of decentralized governance, not just with the payments, but with the issuance of the currency, it creates a different set of technical problems and focuses for what you're trying to deal with. And I think when it comes to the problems we need to be dealing with urgently right now, there's a real dearth of the kind of open source, collaborative, decentralized development innovation that we're seeing in the crypto space around systems designed to be native to public money that fit the unique constraints and needs and capacities of a public monetary system. Just as a really basic example, when you don't have to mine to control issuance, because issuance is part of macroeconomic policy more broadly, you have a very different relationship to, for example, the need for a common ledger or the kinds of intermediaries that have influence over the ongoing processing within the system. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're saying a lot. You're, you're triggering a lot of things as you speak there. Um, so, but you're okay with something like Monero, an open source permissionless project existing. You're okay yeah. with it existing yeah, of and, compete, yeah. and competing in, in yeah, any yeah. way against these. Yeah, I mean, there, there, I, yeah, there are there are distinct things that public money uh, can do and enjoys in terms of legal privileges that I don't think we should extend to private currencies in the same way as I don't think we should extend the same powers that we grant the military to Blackwater. <laughs> Um, I think of that as a matter of public, you know, resources and public administration. But 
yeah, absolutely. There's a very important role for those kinds of currencies to exist. And particularly, as I said, to push technology and to, and to sort of keep these alternative sort of systems, you know, in operation in some way. But I don't, you know, just to use a really basic example, when it comes to climate change, which I think is a really big issue, and we are not going to deal with that without collective action in terms of state governments. And that may be through, you know, revolution, peaceful or not, of those governments, but it's not going to come outside the systems of, you know, education and industry and all the things that governments do. And when you focus on sort of, quote unquote, freeing the payments, the money layer, and then sort of revolution follows, I think it's not, it's not a viable way to deal with those problems. Okay. When I, when I, yeah, when I heard you talking, I mean, I, I felt like you were almost talking about Monero. I was like, okay, it, it exists. You want digital cash to exist. Um, so it, it does exist. Monero works today as digital cash. Well, it what, depends. Yeah, it depends yeah. what you mean by cash, right? It works like a, a cash instrument mm -hmm. in some ways, but it doesn't work like cash, like the Federal Reserve notes in your pocket in important monetary ways, putting aside the technicals of payment. It is a different legal instrument. It has a different degree of risk. It has a different degree of receivability in different contexts. And that will never change, in my opinion. <laughs> There's not a point where one day Monero and money are the same thing. Money or currency are the same thing. It will always be that other thing. And the, the sort of examples of this are the instruments today that we use a huge amount of that are the closest thing to public currency, to public money. Things like bank deposits, things like money market fund shares, things like, you know, even sort of safe forms of commercial paper or repos, things that big numbers of people with a lot of money use as money in really important moments like 2008 and this pandemic, the difference between them and actual public money becomes even bigger. And if the difference between bank money that we use like almost unthinkingly as, as an equivalent to public money and actual currency is so important. How do how important do we think the difference between Monero and currency is going to be? I think pretty important. And so I think it's a different solution to a different kind of problem. Yeah, and no, I don't necessarily, you know, I'll, I'm not necessarily anti CBDCs. You know, I, I'm, I'm curious to see uh, what the government can come up with. Um, but I'm definitely excited about Monero because I, it, it already exists and it's working and, uh, you know, it, it does have these properties where you're not reliant upon um, a government or a corporation. It's decentralized. And uh, I think there's a lot of value there. Uh, and I get what you're saying. You're saying you think, you know, monetary policy is, is, is something that a government should have control over and they should be able to uh, basically you know, turn the knobs, if you will, as needed uh, for their for their money money system. Well, um, I I, th I think that's I think that's how we have it today, and mm -hmm. I I don't think that comes at the expense of private currencies or private monies operating next to each other. For the record, but I do think it it does something different. And to talk about what Monero does, okay, but to talk about what it doesn't do is equally important. And I think there's a really important conversation about whatever you might want to live in a world where public money doesn't occupy the role that it does. The one that we actually live in, the one that we are going to be living in as we build these new things is, is one in which that distinction is very important. I mean, a thought that comes to my mind is though, you know, why am I going to want to hold a CBDC or a Fed coin um, when it's go when more of it is just going to be printed at will as opposed to something like Monero, where the supply is known, the emission curve is known, and I, you know, I basically know the the, the well, amount of Monero yeah. I hold, and know that 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 amount isn't going to, uh, you know, be uh, you know diminished uh, at 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 the will of a government that wants to create more of it. Because I mean, and this is where I think I lose you guys. You know, with respect, I think that. Or you can't, the, the coming in with concerns about privacy and transactions, I, I, I'm there for. I'm here for all day. Coming in with the idea that the problem is that money is soft and, a, and able to be used as an active tool of public governance, 
is not about privacy and is not about technology. It's about macroeconomics and monetary theory. And what you're asking is a question that, for example, John Maynard Keynes addressed in like the 1930s. Now, there's a lot of people that disagree with him and they have specific disagreements and there's specific arguments about certain parts of how we think about public liquidity and investment and things today. But the, starting from, well, why isn't a hard currency good is not to me a really good starting point because we've had a hundred years of talking about why hard currencies don't work. Now, there's a small group of people who I don't share their political goals about, you know, the natural order of inequality and property rights and, and those things in the slightest, who think that, uh, you know, the ability to adjust uh, public spending to meet demand is somehow inherently suspect. But I don't think that's the reality. The reality is all of those different private monies we were just talking about, bank deposits, money market fund shares, Monero, Bitcoin, whatever else, are all out there as assets. They all are inflating something. And the question of how much we create of different assets for different purposes is itself a question of public policy. If we say, okay, banks can create trillions of dollars in deposits every time they make loans, and that's fine. And private actors can create things like Monero or things like Tether, where maybe there's no real value proposition other than fraud, but they're going to keep the thing alive long enough to scam a bunch of people. Or maybe it's something like um, uh, the, the Starbucks gift cards that are basically money nowadays, and it's the cheapest form of financing for Starbucks of all of its forms of corporate debt access. All of those things have the ability to affect overall demand, to affect purchasing power, right? The purchasing power of particular people over others that we choose to grant them recognition of their claims, etc. So I don't think there's this world of sort of a fixed pot of money. And then the question is, you know, when you pour more in, you devalue it all. We, we grow as a population, we grow in production. We need more investment and spending to keep that production at its frontier. And when it comes to the difference between public spending and private, people like Hyman Minsky, monetary scholars and, and, and financial system experts have done a pretty good job, in my opinion, of explaining why relying on private credit is inherently destabilizing. It, it, it creates uh, a, a self-reinforcing system of, of booms and busts that hurts a lot of people along the way. And whether you agree with it or not, where we've gotten to historically now is we don't let that happen. We bail out banks, we bail out money market fund actors because depositors are a, a stakeholder group that we care about. And that's because we care about the money itself. We care about the money not collapsing. So when we look at why let public money exist, the answer is because it doesn't collapse on you. We've agreed as a community not to make that the kind of thing you wake up one day and it's cut in half. Now, you know, inflation and things are also real concerns, but that's different from the actual nominal value of the currency itself. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I was going to get at, you know, why, why, but ultimately, once again, why would I hold this CBDC, this Fed coin, when I can hold Bitcoin or Monero, that's not going to be in Because you can, you can pay, because you can pay your taxes with it, you can pay your parking fine with it, you can pay your, um, your kids braces with it, you can use it uh, to, to satisfy debts denominated in dollars in other contracts, right? That whole system is tied up with the legal system, the policing system, the military system. It isn't something you just remove and say, oh, like one day I choose apples and the next day I choose oranges, right? It's not the same thing. They, they are fundamentally different. They have different properties. When you have a hundred dollar bill, it's always worth a hundred dollars worth of tax relief. Nothing that Monero can ever offer can do the same thing. Well, as, as people adopt it and accept it, then doesn't it? I mean, we, we saw El Salvador no. adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. Yeah, yeah and, and, and the exchange rate between Bitcoin and the US dollar is going to be something they have no hope in hell of actively controlling, which means it's going to be out of their control. One day your Bitcoin could be enough to pay your tax bill. The next day the market could turn and you could be completely screwed for the rest of the year. Mm. That's, yeah. that's a real risk. And the yeah. same is true of any private currency. And, and it's not just like something with your own unit of account. Bank deposits did this for hundreds of years until we created deposit insurance. Money market funds did this until we started bailing them out. It's a natural tendency for people to create money that looks and talks like it's safer than it is, and then to hurt people when that 
inevitably re is revealed to be false. So, yeah, because you had said, um, so do you think Monero has has legitimate use case? Or you're saying it, it Yeah, I, I think there's a, I think there's a use case. I mean, first of all, there are people who value things because they value them. And that that is as real as anything else, right? There's a market for Beanie Babies. There are people out there that could buy more Beanie Babies today than, you know, th th that money could be used to, to, to solve hung hunger or homelessness. Now, it doesn't, you know, you, you don't eat Beanie Babies, but the point is people with real purchasing power are putting it into Beanie Babies and not other things with other types of value. That's true of any private currency. Any community that cares enough about something can sustain its value. Now, in, in the case of Monero particularly, there are values, I think, that it represents, which are also good reasons to use it, like privacy. Now, I'm not sure if, again, I think the best way to ensure privacy at a societal level is to do that, in part because I don't think public money, uh, pri these kinds of private currencies can, can really replace public money, but also because I think there are probably inherent design constraints with the way that Monero is built around a common ledger, even when it's shielded, that you don't have when you can centralize the issuance and you don't have to rely on uh, decentralized monetary policy as well as decentralized payments architecture. But um, the the kinds of you know private currencies and things that we're talking about have no way of guaranteeing any value that is related to public systems. And we saw this throughout history, even with the gold standard, even with convertibility of gold into coins, sovereigns moved up and down the exchange rates. They moved up and down those convertibility rates. Why? Because what matters is that public unit of account, how much the law will recognize. You had a contract in gold and now it's in, in paper currency. Well, tough shit. That's not, you know, that's not something you have a control over. That's a societal choice in the same way as choosing whether something's a public park or private property is a social choice. Do you hold? Do you hold any cryptos? Do you use any crypto? What? what? I mean, I've, I, you know, I've experimented with them, but no, I don't. I don't play around in the same way as I don't. You know, invest. I wouldn't invest in pharmaceutical stocks if I was a scholar of health policy. So no. Oh, for those are all right. So just because you don't want to. Uh, all right, that that fair enough on that. Um, do you do you see validity in in holding them for purposes of a, avoiding in things like inflation? I mean, I think everyone has a right to hedge against inflation in their own individual context, sure. Uh, but I, I don't think that collectively it, it works. I think what actually deals with inflation is a good, robust economic policy, is, is actual production, is is goods that are well managed and resourced. When it, when it came time to beat the Nazis, we did not defer to the market and sort of adjust interest rates and hope private investment would lead the charge, right? We doubled real output in six years. Um, and people had a pretty decent standard of living through that. I know there's all these sort of, you know, often uh, uh, the, these sort of pictures of bread lines and stuff. But the reality is public nutrition in the UK, for example, skyrocketed during the world, world War because they had free restaurant lunches to people as part of a food health program. And the United States people had, you know, uh, the largest amount of, of personal savings at the end of World War II, um, I think, than it ever had in history. Uh, and it also helped to, uh, you know, usher in a different kind of relationship between minority groups and civil rights because they were key parts of industry and they were actually important, you know, parts of a larger productive machine. It's sad to me that the only time that we ever care about that kind of stuff is sort of in the three months at the depths of the pandemic or when there are literal Nazis, um, even though they're sort of both today, but we aren't doing it for climate change or anything else. So you, you want to hold against as a currency hedge, go for it. But if you're waking up every day and your biggest problem is how do I keep the money that I have from losing value? Uh, to me, you're sitting on a tiny island of gold while the world is burning. There are such bigger problems. Get out of your own bubble and, and think about the actual monetary issues that are going to shape whether we have any freedom in the next hundred years. Because you guys know a lot more than the average person. But the number of people in crypto, not you, that are obsessed with number go up yeah, and that kind yeah. of bullshit is just a, a disgrace to the people in the community that have real values, in my opinion. Understood. I'm, but I mean, pe pe people are people are people. We, we yeah, know yeah. people are greedy. You know, I, th I think you would even admit that you, you have some, I'm sure, a desire to succeed in life, whether it's through uh, your, your own number go up or something else that you value in life that you're trying to achieve. Uh, but in the most simple form, most people, uh, you know, activate that through this, you know, trying to obtain more money. Uh, so, I mean, is, isn't it human nature to 
to want to conserve your wealth. So like to, to that, that's to fine. I'm, I'm not saying to, to see the bigger picture. They're, they're just not going to do it. You know, they're going. Well, some to- people do. That's how we. That's how we get things that actually help. Right. That's how we get a, an eight-hour working day or universal healthcare or things is that we actually do have people that do get up and do that. But I yeah. think you know, if you if people want to be concerned about their own personal wealth, fine. But what I'm saying is when it comes to designing a monetary system, when it comes to strategizing what the most important issues to actually care about in the public square today are, that question is not how do I preserve my wealth? That, that That is not the right framework to be dealing with what the future of money represents now as a turning point for our, for our species is that we have to decide whether you know, the, the money that we all actually use, not the people who've got enough to hedge in gold. Because frankly, if you've got enough money to hedge in a hard asset, you're already in a tiny fraction of the, the world. If you're talking about real money, you're talking about $50 or something, but like if you're talking about actually having a portfolio where you allocate risk, you are you are in a, a tiny class of very privileged people relative to most people who are struggling to get through the week. And the questions that we have to deal with now about, for example, anonymity, but also public administration, Right? We just had a massive pandemic in the United States and millions of people were not given cash relief and others were because of the way that we delivered that money and because of the conditions we attached to that money. I, w- I would say the people that are, that, are most, that are most hurt by inflation are unfortunately those that, that are impoverished, those that don't, can't afford to own assets. Those are the people that are most negatively impacted. This is a, this is a nice story, right? But first, no, no, no. First of all, a lot of those people are far more in debt than they are in terms of having a positive income stream, and inflation reduces the value of those debts. But okay. the, the other the other thing is that a, a lot of those a lot of the people you're talking about are also operating in other spaces beyond just having the a certain amount of money and worrying about its its value going down. They're also talking about being workers. They're talking about living in a a place that has public resources. And when we look at what the actual history of fighting inflation is, if we actually, you know, getting beyond theory and getting beyond these kind of pop narratives of individual preferences, the people who've opposed inflation the most over the last 40 years have been large financial actors. They've been conservative politicians who largely have no problem with increased inequality and tax breaks for the super rich. And they're people who have fought against policies that would empower working class people with jobs and income and a social safety net. Those are the people that actually get up every day and talk about inflation as a reason not to do certain things in the political sphere. So we can talk as much as you want about whether or not, you know, if you have money, you would be concerned with losing it. I agree. But when it comes to what a kind of hard money politics is today, it's the politics of privilege and class uh, 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 reinforcement. It's not. It's not the radical emancipation of individual people. Look at the look at the bell curve of inequality within most cryptocurrencies. It's, one person owns forty percent of it. The next person owns twenty, and then it goes down. This is not. A, this is not a yeah, problem. No, I, I think. I think ninety nine point nine percent of cryptocurrencies are scams. But you know, there, there's one or two that you know are are living up to. But, but, but that, but that, but that, that exists in that broader context, right? Not, those other ninety-nine percent are also making the same hard money arguments you're making, while they are creating coins that go up and down and crap, collapse in value all over the place. And we're worried about governments providing cash relief to people who are starving. Come on, it's it's not even it's not even on the same plane of concern. And yet, I don't think I've seen, you know, a dozen crypto accounts tweet or, or, or comment about any of that kind of stuff. Their attention is all focused on that other thing. Like, yeah. They can wax lyrical about hard currencies and Mises and Menga and, and, and Hayek and all those people. I don't know how many of them are bothered to open the general theory. Most of them, like I said, just care about, you know, care about their number go up, like, like you said as well. And, you know, but that, that is human nature. Um, and I, I do think, you know, Satoshi was kind of a genius. Obviously, he was a genius, but he was a genius in, in, in the fact that he, he tied in that game theory of... Uh, the system bootstrapping itself through the greed of people trying to obtain obtain the crypto and try and working hard to grow it and grow its adoption because as adoption grows, their their value of what they have goes up. I mean, you, look, your mileage may vary on that. I don't think that's a particularly genius insight. That's the same argument that the Washington consensus and conservative have used for handing over public resources to private actors for the last three hundred years. 
I mean, that that's we'll, we'll we'll let greed build our economy, and then we have Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos, and we wonder why. I you mean, don't think it's good to, to build systems that utilize greed to lead to more distributed? Um, no, I, I didn't say that. I, I said that expecting greed to be an uh, an equivalent to a social good is a mistake. Look, of course, everybody's got an ego. I'm not saying you don't appeal to all parts of human nature and how you design policy. But first of all, we're not all just egotistical animals. And secondly, that that drive has really negative effects. It changes the kinds of infrastructure that we build. It changes the kind of society we live in when the people who are responsible for making everything are private for-profit actors who get to, you know, build toy rockets to space as a reward for making workers piss in bottles for eight hours a day. I mean, that that's the world we live in right now. That's not some theory. That's not a philosophy of, of you know, and, you know, pro-statism. We that greed that you're talking about that Satoshi, you know, Satoshi so brilliantly tapped into is exactly why the planet's burning. Right, but he tapped into it and, and made and turned it into a positive. Turned it well, into I mean, again, I'm not sure I agree with that. That that net assessment is not, I don't, you know, the jury still remains to be out. It is still out, sorry, remains to be seen whether all of the stuff, even people at Monero and Zcash and others who I actually have respect for, is gonna do a shit of difference when it comes to the totalitarian state that's being built right now with CBDCs. It remains to be seen whether that's actually gonna stop anything or not. When China wanted to get rid of miners, it took them what, a week? I mean, I, I don't, I, if we really think they're gonna build surveillance into every person's payroll on the whole planet, but somehow one of these private currencies is gonna save us, I think it's, it's not true. And that to me is the big priority right now. It's not, you know, it's not whether there's a diamond in the rough of a million shitty scams. It's there's there's, a, there's literally a, a building burning around us. Like we need to do something about that. Well, I mean, it, the the diamond in the rough isn't isn't random. It's coming out of people that are working hard on an open source project that are collaborating. I mean, that are yeah, you know, working twenty four seven together to build this stuff. Uh, as opposed to, you know, the, the, the CBDCs, they, you know, they, they sound great in theory, but it, they're, they're literally just currently vaporware. I mean, that's uh, not true. Avant, Avant card existed in the nineties from 92 in Finland. It was, a, it was a stored value chip card. It hasn't done though. I mean, it hasn't done. Well, it, 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 yeah. It had partially with one of the reasons it had a bad rollout was because the people who initiated it from day one planned for it to be spun off as a private venture. It wasn't built to be a universal public good to directly compete and, and be superior to banks and other things. It was explicitly built underneath it. Again, I don't have any love for central banks. That is an ideological failure. And all the cypherpunks at the time didn't, didn't stop them, didn't fight for that other thing. That was anonymous cash, genuine anonymous public cash. We didn't win that fight. Okay, Ecuador tried to do it in 2014 with mobile money. Another good example. That was a that we did not win that fight in part because central bankers and commercial banks and payments actors pushed against it. They used all that greed and self interest to win, and we we lost a public good as a result. So now, right, what what we are looking at is how do we stop that happening with these CBDCs? That to me is the biggest question. And I, I again, I have a lot of respect for a lot of what you guys are doing, but I think fundamentally, you're you're turning up at the wrong battlefield. Your, your video froze a little bit. I mean, I, I, I I'm just going to keep going though because your your sound is fine. Um, people are coming here to hear what you have to say anyway. Not to see, not to see you. No, no offense. You do look good though. Um, but those examples you gave aren't they examples of the fact that you know these centralized approaches aren't working as opposed to something that's organically being created in the marketplace to compete. Yeah. None of those examples were examples of a public currency having any economic problems, any debasement. There was no problem with the actual value. They, they weren't adopted and they're not being used. And that, that is in part because of the lack of public infrastructure around these things. If you go back to that 19th century when, when the first telegraph systems were created, right, the first wires, they were created by private actors and governments took a hands-off role mostly driven by imperialism because it was easier to let these private companies push into foreign countries that you wanted to take over. You know, this is the late 1800s. Um, so you let, you let Western Union or someone like that build the pipes in these other countries that you then want to have an influence over. 
Um, but when it came time for the Fed to build its own digital spit system starting in 1918, it didn't have any telegraph infrastructure. The Postal Service was not invested in and we didn't have an alternative. So they relied on Western Union. And then throughout the, the next century, every time there's a new payments development, the assumption is it will be delivered and administered by private actors. And that's the ecosystem we have today. Now, Satoshi Nakamoto and others can say, well, we're going to harness private initiative. That's what we've been doing. We are living in the wreckage of harnessing private greed to build a good payment system. I'm not convinced that adding crypto before as a prefix changes that trajectory. I mean, so, so, so why stop there? I mean, why, um, why not have Fed car and Fed smartphone and... Um, you know, uh, why, why not, you know, why isn't the entire internet run by, by the federal government? Why, why only apply this to, to money? Well, money has a fundamentally different role in, in communications infrastructure. You can give two people a piece of paper and a pen and they can communicate between each other something that has nothing to do with anyone else. You can't do that with money. Money is about claims on a social commons. Money is about claims on property. It's about contractual obligations that then have to be interpreted one way or another by public legal authorities, right? If you, you and somebody have an agreement, you hand over cash, even if it's private cash, I can take you to court. There's no, there's no world where you don't exist within a web of social accountability when it comes to economic rights. So th it's a fundamentally different thing to say, for example, that I, and I'm a big supporter of, you know, Raspberry Pi, Pine 64, you know, the Pine phone, uh, Freedom Box, things where you're building a, a mesh-based peer-to-peer -peer network that doesn't rely on a single central system. At the same time, we have to meaningfully deal with the fact that satellites and underwater sea cables are public resources. They need to have a collective public response. So I don't, I don't think there's a sort of hard line there. Um, we do provide people with, you know, you say public cars. We, we provide people in Finland with public kids' boxes when the kids get born with, with, with stuff in them, right? We provide kids at school with hot lunches. There are things that we provide as public services that we can look to as a model, but there is a fundamental difference between money and, and communications in general because money is about a claim on economic power. But Monero today, even as small as it is, it, it works as money. You know, I, I, I could purchase- It doesn't, it doesn't work as public Right money. now for Monero, peer to peer, and we, we don't need the government- What, what, you, what no, no. You, the reason you do that is because you live in a world with electricity and running water and courts and a language and a schooling system. You don't do that without the government involved. You've just decided to gray out all the parts in which it's still involved to focus on this one narrow thing, which is the transaction. I didn't gray them out. Yes, yes. Obviously, government partook in, in getting us to where we are today. But no, 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 not that. I'm saying the transaction itself, even with Monero, mm -hmm. it still implicates public law. It's if, if, if you if we make this transaction and then I put a gun to your head and take your mobile phone and force you to put in your pin code and change things, that changes that transaction, even if it was done with Monero. Sure. If I if I don't put a gun to your head, that also changes that transaction, even even if it's done with Monero. Yeah. There is no there is no context where that transaction is occurring without government activity. It, even even when you're using a private currency, you are participating in a larger economic process that is infused from top to bottom with public institutions. Right, right. So, so wouldn't, wouldn't it be good then so that governments did things like, you know, made made Monero legal tender in the United States? And now we have- No, because it's, because it's not a good form of money. It's, you, you, I think you're, just, you're, you're conflating two different parts here, which is the ability to make a transaction, the ability to serve as money. There are plenty of things that can serve as a transaction within a monetary regime. Right? If, if three you people- still have CBDC, you could still have FedCoin alongside yeah, but okay. So now we're getting the question: How do you mean alongside? You mean one to one? You mean when when go. they could be equally legal tender? Not but, that. But at, at what exchange rate? Value. At what exchange rate? The market would decide. The what, no, but no, that, that's not a real thing. What What do you mean? Which a particular index? So you and I go to court, and you say that the price on at nine o'clock on a Monday morning was X, according to. Uh, index I would, I would say. I say. I say the relevant one price. XMR. I want my one XMR back. But, but, but I choose to pay you in dollars. How many dollars? If you stole XMR, you know, it's a... It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a and, I, and I choose to pay I choose to pay damages in dollars. I don't have to pay in XMR. 
Uh, how, many, how many? How many? What's the exchange rate? If you steal my car or if you steal my Mickey Mantle card and I want it back, you're just going to give me back the value of the card? No, I want, I want the Mickey Mantle card back. If I steal it and light it on fire, you have, I get to pay you money. That's that's the that's we, we this is this is a, a pretty basic part of contract law that we don't enforce specific performance in most cases of conversion. We 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 enforce damages denominated in dollars. So you and I have a contract dispute involving chickens. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't resolve that by counting the number of chickens I have to give back. I resolve that by paying you. Right? No, that's one that's one way to resolve it. It's right. not and, mandated and, that you that's the only way to resolve it. If you have the chickens, I may want the chickens back because but the court isn't necessarily going to enforce value. I mean, but the, the court the court isn't going to necessarily enforce that. We have extremely specific context today where we will right, enforce. Right, so, so we can start to change the laws to more more okay, which way though? Which in way? a more positive way, yeah. But, but you, this is putting the cart before the horse, right? This is a solution in search of a problem. The point of this was supposed to improve monetary administration. And now you're coming up, you, we, there's a whole bunch of problems that you haven't actually addressed that are fundamental to whether this works or not. What, what exchange rate are we talking about? So you, you said the market. Right now, there are seven different potential market rates we could be using as a benchmark. That at any point in time, the question of which point in time we refer to is also something that's going to have to be worked out. There is no way to say, oh, we'll just, you know, yada, yada, yada. The, the question of having multiple units of account under the same system. There's a long history of trying to do that with bimetallist movements and others. And it creates tensions. There are real problems to be worked out. Let me, let me ask you that. Are you okay with, you said you're okay with Monero existing, obviously. Are, are you okay with people using it in a peer-to-peer -peer way to transact? Yeah, yeah. I, I have no problem with baseball cards either. Okay. I, uh, I, I consider them to be roughly the same in the sense that they both have a value that floats against public currency and that we could use them in payments for all sorts of things, but that they are never going to address the core question of how the, the public currency actually works. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, baseball cards wouldn't work nearly as well as Monero in terms of using it as a, as a currency. I mean, it depends what room you're in, but yeah, sure. I mean, I understand that. Room. I mean, I, if you can't agree on that, that's just this is very silly. No, I'm, I'm, if, first if, of all, if, if, first if, of all if, Monero is fungible. One one unit of Monero equals one unit of Monero. Uh, it could be zapped anywhere around the world, basically instantly for a third of a cent. Uh, you know, how, how am I going to pay you with my my baseball card? I mean, that's I'm, 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 my, well, first of all, if there's three people sitting around a room. They can do whatever the hell they want between the three of them. We use pieces of paper and games and Monopoly all the time. So I wasn't talking about as a general public payment system in, in, in the world. I'm saying we can use in a room whatever kinds of payment systems we want. And that room can be whatever. Right? People People use, you know, cigarettes in prisons. And it's not because cigarettes are a great form of money in general. It's because that that's what works in that context. So I have no problem with Monero. And I think that some of the technology you're building is going to be very useful. But I don't think it's a substitute for public money. I don't think it's I don't think it's an alternative to money. It's like saying, well, we can get from, you know, we can do this one function. Therefore, we can, you know, serve as an alternative to the whole thing. The whole thing is so much bigger than that one individual transaction you're talking about. Um why should I trust like Fedcoin though? So you know, in, in addition, you shouldn't. To you shouldn't. I don't trust it. That's why I spend all my time working on to make sure it's something that we don't have to worry is going to be constantly hurting us. Right. So you know, obviously, you you want privacy to be implemented into it, but why would I ever trust that that, that privacy is real? That you know, uh, my data isn't being tracked, or that. Um, what, you know, I mean, basically, uh, who knows what, what the government, well, we, we can't, we can't trust it. Right. That's, that's why we need to demand a system where every part of it is visible, every part of it. And it's as basic and as low Jack as possible. I mean, this is part of why things like hardware secured cards are so important because they aren't as complicated as uh, a, a, a sort of decentralized network that could have all kinds of intermediaries baked in in different layers, which is what a lot of these central banks are looking at creating now and um we shouldn't trust them but we don't you know we shouldn't trust them today I, that's it to me at least a huge part of the cypherpunk ethos which is you don't trust these people but that also means that when it comes to actually having privacy the way that we're going to do that is through fighting for it in the streets not just in terms of currency but in terms of the whole internet in terms of you know the ability to 
make the transaction across a network that's not going to be you know compromised along the way or that we can even use devices that don't have backdoors in it and so the the question of how we have a value of that privacy is not about well can we build this technology and and sneak around them and then they won't be able to turn it off no 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 that to me is not the right strategy the strategy has to be well that's a cypherpunk strategy yeah, yeah, that's the sidebunk strategy. And I think, to me at least, that's the monetary strategy of cryptocurrencies. You're not going up to the front door trying to beat it down and to, and to, to occupy the castle, right? Private cryptocurrencies are, are sort of like, you know, off to the side doing this other thing. And it's not a, it's not a substitute to me. You're not going to but it, deal, it, deal with the surveillance state. Um, by by trying to build a private money because you know worse comes to worse they just roll tanks down the street. Hmm. I, so so you don't you don't believe in this concept of of building a, a technology outside? No 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 uh, I absolutely no. do I, I absolutely believe in that but I don't think that's enough and when it comes to money I don't think money is just a question of technology it's like saying I'll build a I'll, I'll build a technology to interpret contracts outside of a courtroom. It, to me, that that's it, it doesn't. It's a category error. You can bake in protocols and parameters and conditional statements into a into a contract. You are not replicating what a judge does. Yeah, I, I, you know, con contracts are still going to exist. Laws are still going to exist, but I don't see why. But how how, how are we going to run a, 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 an economy where the the last hope, the big saving grace against totalitarianism is cryptocurrency? But every time you have a dispute with a with a vendor. Every time you have a problem on the bus with your bus fare or something, you go back to that same totalitarian court system or you buy a, a house and it's the same totalitarian system running the mortgage registry, right? You're not outside of the thing you're trying to run away from. Yeah, well, th those are other problems that need to be solved. I, I don't think, yeah. I mean, I, I certainly don't claim that, you know, uh, Monero is going to solve all, all of government's issues and, and prevent. You know, I, don't, I don't mean that. I understand that. that. It's that would be a straw man, right? Helping the fight against tyranny. It's, it's going to preserve our liberty in, in the digital age. I'm, I'm confident. Nice. Well, okay, that, that's where we disagree. I don't think that a private currency can preserve all the liberties that we currently have with cash. Not all the liberties. Well, I think, it, I think it works better than, than, than cash. It doesn't for paying your taxes. Not for paying your taxes, but for preserving your liberty, it does. Not as good as cash that you can use to pay your taxes. That's the that's the comparison. You can't keep you can't keep negotiating down the terms of success. The, the the comparison here is we have public money, currency that is worth a dollar is worth a dollar that we use all over the place in legitimate ways of, of interacting with the world. Not at the dark fringes, which I have love for, but not there in the in the broad daylight in our day jobs. That system is about to lose anything coming close to cash like privacy unless we do something about it. Monero is not doing something about that. It already works. Monero already solved the problem. It hasn't, though, because it, has, it, it can't do all the things that public money can do. All you've done is say, all that other stuff is out there. It's someone else has got to deal with that. What, what an actual public money would be, would be you could get paid at your job in this thing and you could take it to any court, any officer, any tax man and satisfy for legal tender. And the questions about how it's issued on what basis would be ones determined collectively like we do today. It's not, it's not turning back to some digital gold or some world where there are decisions that we can't collectively make. It's not returning to some sort of neo-feudalism by, by, by decree from a sort of person who wrote something and now they're long gone that we can never question. It's actually acknowledging that public money today is elastic. We issue it in trillions of dollars to support all kinds of activities. It's not just you and me making a transaction. Monero is not is not an alternative to like the social security system. Yeah, I don't I don't think anybody's claiming that. I, but I that's but that's what a public private money needs to do. That's what a publicly issued privacy respecting money needs to do. Yeah, so like I said, I don't necessarily Monero agree public. with the, the advent yeah. of, of a Fed coin, and you know we'll we'll see how how it does. Um, and you know, I hope I hope it it has privacy baked into it. I certainly won't trust that privacy. No, I wouldn't either. Yeah. Um, how about the the censorship resistant nature of something like Monero versus a Fed coin? Do you think that's a good attribute? I mean, you know, nobody can stop me from 
sending Manette, in addition to it being private, you can't you can't stop the use of it. You can't censor it. Well, first of all, I, I would say phys physical currency does that already, right? So that that's a yeah. And and what Monero is offering is at best something that can do that, but with an inferior form of private money. I think it does so, it better because I could do I could do it with you right now. How am I going to? No no, 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 no. Please listen. I'm not talking about the payments. I'm talking about the money itself. I'm saying yeah. you personally may value hard currency. Okay, that's fine. Let's just stipulate that you think that's a good thing. Sure. For the for the vast majority of people that are not choosing to spend most of their life holding gold and think that moving away from the gold standard was a good thing, not a bad thing, right? That the New Deal was a good thing. That group of people are not going to look at Monero and go, this is as good as, as dollars. It's it's an inferior form of private money. Not not for payments, not for what you do to, to hand it over to somebody, but as something that you can guarantee is going to be worth the thing you want it to be usable for tomorrow. Monero does not I mean, have the... the monetary uh, yes. aspects, yes. the monetary theory aspect. So you, it's a, you offer a trade-off. You say, maybe we'll give you the privacy, but you have to take an inferior private money. And I'm think, saying, I'm saying, well, except except for a second, the premise. I get you. I get you disagree. Okay. If that difference is what I'm saying, a public privacy respecting currency does not have to provide a trade off on. If if the choice is as I believe it is, and I accept you disagree, between a privacy respecting public money that has all of the features of public money today or a privacy respecting private money that can't replicate all of the features of public money today. That it's the first one we should be advocating for. The second one is already giving too much up. Right, but you're, you're never gonna have something that's gonna have the privacy of, you're never gonna be able to trust, you know, a, a privacy preserving CBDC coin. Or one that I, I'm, not sure I, I'm not sure I agree with that. An open, an open hardware card uh, or an open hardware phone that uses a trusted executing environment running open source code. I'm not sure that I would, you know, I'm, I'm not sure there's any greater risk on that than using Monero over pipes that are controlled by those same governments you're worried about. Right. And the censorship resistant nature of it, you're not going to be able to trust that, which I, I'm not well, sure. Well, no, again, they're, they're a peer to peer offline capable government digital currency models. They are censorship resistant in the same way as physical cash is censorship resistant. We already do have a physical a censorship resistant version of public money. You don't think they'd be, they'd be able to lock up people's Fedcoin and prevent them from using it? No more than you can lock people up who own private coins. Not lock the people up, lock the but you know that, but, but listen to what I'm saying. No more than you can lock those people up. If you don't like somebody doing something and they're going, nah, 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 I'm doing it with public Fedcoin, and then they're doing it with Monero. You just lock the other, you lock the latter person up if you don't like what they're doing. It, it, what you're talking about and saying it's censorship resistant, it's only censorship resistant on one layer. Right? It's only censorship resistant on I mean, the yeah, actual. So they could come and lock me up, but I'd still, it's, that's still better than them being able to lock me up and take all my money. Well, when they lock you up, they also take all your money. My point is, if it, what you're describing is not actually building a defense against the kinds of people coming after you that you're talking about. At best, it's a steel door in a straw house, right? Uh, uh, what, what we actually need is a political coalition that gives a shit about privacy in people's daily lives. Not just because they're libertarians, not just because they're gold bugs, but because this is something like in you know, World War II and afterwards, you dob on your friends, you tell the police where your friends are and who they are and when you met them. Right, you're you're part of that other group of people that we just fought a war against, right? That that idea that I'm not going to give up people, I'm not going to snitch on my fellow kind of you know person living in the world. It requires a kind of political coalition and support that goes way beyond just building good technology. And when you when you have that coalition, to me, the public money is just as protectable. That's what's yeah. protecting cash today. Right. I'd be more interested in seeing that that political support being built around uh, the, you know, acceptance of crypto and helping crypto flourish. Well, yeah, I, I think I think you're you're confusing your agendas. I think what you're doing there is letting indulging in 
a, a, a theory about money at a time when you should be building a coalition about privacy. I, I don't think that the, the five percent of mostly white men that are interested in libertarian monetary theory are going to suddenly become 80 percent tomorrow um in part because we've seen those historical attempts when 80 percent of people were hard money advocates and it hurt a lot of people and we said let's not do that anymore but if the only way to have a coalition that's going to respect privacy is that people believe in the monetary theory of crypto i think that's a losing proposition it's 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 the public really monetary theory of the white men thing it, i mean it's completely permissionless anybody can participate in the network the network but is it, but it's not blind to it's, who you are you could you could be a refrigerator on, on the monero network i mean no, nobody I'm, I'm not talking i'm not talking about monero specifically i'm talking about the crypto space which i think anyone that's not blind has to acknowledge is mostly white men is a space where the reason people are interested, the reason the narratives, the means, the culture, the values, the like religiosity about the Bitcoin white paper and others, the reason that is also powerful to them is specific to their values and interests. It's not, it's not about to universalize in the way that we that you would need to be able to perfectly mesh the privacy fight and the crypto fight. If the only way people can are, are told to care about privacy is to suddenly start believing in a space where by your own words, you know, 99% of them are scams. I think it's, it's a losing problem. We have a thing called cash right now in people's pockets that has dead presidents on them. They learn about in elementary school and people know that that thing has value and they like having more of that thing. And they like not having big brother tell them how to use it. That is, is we do not have to convince them and shouldn't because I think it's a failed proposition, but even if you thought it was a good one, shouldn't have to convince them that, that actually, you know, central banks and elastic monetary supplies are debasing their life savings and all this stuff that they really should be, you know, invest in like the equivalent of gold in the digital realm. That is going to lose all the, all the people who you actually need to care enough to not have a totalitarian state because not that many people believe in that kind of economics and theory of markets and theory of the value of money. Um, I think there's a good reason most people don't believe in that. Yeah, but, but it, it's very simple for people to see that, you know, that their carton of milk is going from, you know, $2 to $10. And if you tell them, well, if, if you held Bitcoin or Monero instead of dollars, that carton of milk wouldn't be going up in price as fast. I mean, that doesn't isn't that something that can relate that anybody can relate to? In the sense that it's it's sort of simple and obvious and wrong, because what you're talking about there is again talking about another commodity. The same thing that you just said could be true of baseball cards, right? Right, but it's inflate i mean you, you you're trying to deny the fact that inflation ex is exists among no, no no i'm saying that this idea that, that everybody looks at the history of money and says this is debasing purchasing power over time the average person today has far more real wealth and real living standards than people did at at, at, at earlier times in part because wages and incomes and other benefits have gone up as well as prices right also because there are certain things that we provide now that we don't charge a price for that we never used to provide anyone at all. Yeah, people, you know, water that doesn't have you know shit in it. For example. Right. Well, that's that's because of technology and because of of our. our it's, it's also because of public resources and public investment, because we took responsibility for that stuff. There's a reason the United States doesn't give healthcare to everybody, and other countries do, because it's not just about technology. It's because they took responsibility for providing that as a public good in other countries and haven't done it here. And because they allowed help technology flourish they allowed it to flourish they allowed capitalism to flourish that the, the you know a lot, yeah, it, of, a lot of those things came from that no well it, i i don't think a lot of the, the technological innovation came from allowing you know carnegie and rockefeller to grind people's faces into the dust and again i don't think that most of amazon's innovation comes from jeff bezos being such a brilliant person he deserved to shoot himself into space right i don't think that what you're describing as capitalism is just these private actors working for their own benefit there was a huge you know the reason we have weekends the reason we have you know children don't work in slavery is because we pass laws preventing those people that you're talking about from doing those things right we we have simultaneously just as we've unleashed capitalism we have also put in the processes of taming it and building spaces outside of its excesses and those spaces to me are some of the most important places 
where the real increase in people's living standards actually comes from. Would, would you consider yourself a Marxist? Sure. I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I don't consider myself a Marxist because most Marxists have very, very doctrinaire views on what Marx is. But I think he was generally right on a lot of things. Sure. Yeah. So, I, so tell me more about that. So, the, what, what direction do you? Well, want? I mean, one, one way you get one way you get from that is to start looking at the actual way that money works. Mm -hmm. Right. Most monetary systems involve the public provisioning, and you know, most of the entities that they publicly provision are not democratic ones, certainly not just ones, right? Most of them are warlords and kings and, you know, all these things throughout history. But monetary systems are designed to provision public actors with the resources necessary to govern and administrate, right? The police, the schools, the military, you know, back in the day, it would have been, would have been soldiers for, for a warlord's army, right? But that, but that system, which today includes the waterways and the healthcare and, and the schools and the libraries and all the things, that, again, I think actually good, as well as the, the, the military and, and the surveillance state. Um, that system fundamentally takes people as workers um, out of a commons and puts them in a space where they have to earn money to survive. Not, not private money, but actual public money. And historically, they did this quite explicitly. They put hut taxes or head taxes or other things where you would owe a certain amount of dollars. And once you're in that monetary economy where you have to acquire dollars, which is for the record, there's still the economy we live in today, where you have to use public money to survive, then whoever controls that public money controls how much freedom people have. And one of the things that, that I get from that, and a lot of other people have got from that is, when it comes to, for example, employment and work, what we define as productive, socially useful work is a public question. It's a social question. It's not just the people who've already got money or who already own factories. It's also us collectively through in institutions of public governance. So when we, for example, have explicit monetary and macroeconomic policies designed to keep unemployment at 5%, which in the United States is millions of people, right? The size of entire countries we're keeping unemployed. We're doing that deliberately. We're doing that through our monetary theories, through our monetary system. We are choosing to issue money in certain ways and not others that keep some people unemployed. So you don't have to be that much of a Marxist, at least to me, to look at that and say, that sounds pretty similar to what he talks about, the reserve army of the unemployed, where the way that private capital keeps its power over workers is by threatening them with unemployment. The worst thing, even worse than being exploited by capitalism, is to not be exploited by capitalism, right? And when you're in that position, the alternative, which would normally be you could get a public job, is taken away and the unemployment is deliberately maintained at a rate that will keep the other workers hungry. And we're seeing that right now. I mean, you don't have to get back into history to look at that. We're seeing that right now. People are saying unemployment insurance is too generous. People aren't wanting to take our shitty $7 an hour jobs. Um, we should cut unemployment insurance so that people would be willing to take our shitty jobs and work for us in, in, in markets. And in my view, there's a third answer to that. I'm not saying we shouldn't cut, we, 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 should, we should definitely keep unemployment insurance and expand it, but the third option is to offer jobs directly and say, hey, when we create money, the things we buy with it, whether that's military labor or educational labor or care labor, are the things we collectively valuing as a society. And what? that to me is the monetary aspect of what we now understand as sort of labor relations is until you have the ability to tell the boss to fuck off, and walk down the street and get a different job where you're still contributing to society and, and being a you know healthy, active member of your community and, and earning an income that you can sustain. Until you can do that, we are putting private capitalists in the driver's seat of how we access money. And I think I think that to me is where you, 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 that's a sort of pretty clear example of the sort of Marxian theory of labor exploitation, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, you don't have to believe in Marx to understand that public money functions differently to private credit or private. You know, so, I mean, it assets. starts to sound like, so then you would be okay with, you know, Fed coin being programmable in ways where the government can have control over society. No, why? No, I, I, that's. I hope. I hope I haven't given that impression because that goes against everything you, I've been saying about privacy. That, that you're that, that you want. You, you know, you kind of want 
let, let's talk about in terms of the United States, right? So, uh, you, you know, you'd want this country to move in a direction where it's, it's more centrally controlled and planned, correct? No, I don't think that's true. I think we already live in a system that's centrally controlled and planned. It's just mostly centrally controlled and planned through delegation of power and control over key infrastructure to private for-profit actors, right? The, the telecommunication spectrum right now is already pretty centrally planned. It's just centrally planned in a way that gives certain people who hold those licenses control over it and others not. When we look at intellectual property, right? And I appreciate you guys do open source, right? When you look at intellectual property, the way that we create intellectual property is not decentralized. It's very, very, very centralized. Um, that's the problem. So I don't, and, and you know, when you look at finance, it's the same thing, um, including, for example, just to be clear, the limited liability that every one of these actors, including most people in the crypto space, enjoy. You, you want to lose all your money and be sued? What stops you? The government stepping in and saying, you created a corporation, we're going to grant limited liability to that, so you can't personally be sued. That is a massive handout to every quote-unquote entrepreneur to socialize all of the risk that they take on there. Because worst comes to worst, you just collapse the company and move on. So yeah, I, don't, I don't think it's about, I don't think I'm sort of pro-centralization. I think giving people jobs is a massive empowerment of individuals and creating public cash is a massive empowerment of individuals. Right, but gi giving people jobs is, is centralization, right? You, you, need, you need the- No, no, Keep, the keeping, people, keeping people unemployed today is also centralization. I think if you, if you view this solely in terms of a, like a knob that you're moving back and forth between more and less centralization, you're missing the point. When, when people like Ted Turner own, you know, 40% of Montana, and if I try to walk on that, ra that ranch, I could very well be shot. That is centralized. It's private property, sure, but it's not decentralized. It's very, very centralized. There's one particular person in one particular place that has a legal claim that will be recognized by all of the courts and all of the military system. And the same thing is with unemployment. When the central banks today choose to keep unemployment at 5%, they say, I think this is the lowest we want to get to. That is absolutely centralized. So I don't think giving something that you've been hoarding back to people is, is, the, is an act of centralizing power. I think it's an act of dispersal. How did you get involved in uh, being on, on this committee, this uh, FedCoin committee, the congressional hearing? I'm just curious how that how that works. Oh, I just well, because probably because I worked on with, with you know with various legislators on on particular pieces of this legislation, you know, on on stuff around you know the ABC Act and things. Probably why. Yeah. Okay. Can Can you tell us more about that? I'm just curious, like the inner workings. You know. Uh... Well, I mean, you know, a lot a lot of these congressional staff are really really interested in in important you know questions, but they're also drinking from a fire hose and have a million things going on. And so when the time comes, just like with groups like Coin Center, you know, in the crypto space, and they have to look at these sort of complicated questions, they they solicit input from people in the community and people who have, you know, expertise in things. And so I had been involved with some other things around um, uh, around data privacy uh, in, in, in different contexts. And then Somebody put me in touch with people and said, yeah, look, you know, what are you guys working on? I said, well, anything I can do to help? And then it was like, well, we were trying to work out some of these questions and we just talked about it. And I don't have any power or control over anything other than, you know, the ability to try and convince people of what I think makes sense. But when it comes to, for example, creating an e-cash option, um, there weren't that many people in that space who were sort of focusing on that. And so there was a sort of opening to, to really emphasize that and to say, hey, look, you know, there are a lot of other things going on here that are good, but we need this as well. And that was a, you know, I, I'm happy to have helped push that because I think it's really critical um, precisely because I don't want all that kind of programmable money and things. I think we need to, we need, we need to keep our money dumb. Like we keep our taps dumb um, when it, when it gives water to people. I don't, I don't want to tap asking whether you're a terrorist before it gives you water. And, and I don't want, uh, I don't want, you know, your money asking the same thing. Yeah, I just, I just don't know. I mean, what I'm struggling to, to understand is I just don't know how we then trust the government to move in that direction once they, they have that power. Once they create FedCoin, how are you then trusting that it won't evolve into something that is programmable or, you know, that it won't have the back doors that we're talking about? That's, that's my... Well, you don't, I don't, again, I don't, I don't think you trust it. I think you, you force accountability on it. By precisely by not walking away 
and and just try to do something else over there in a sandbox. I think you you, you force this accountability by getting the kinds of voices that actually have you know a stake in this together and demanding that they don't build that other thing. Um, or, you know, or they should, hey? or creating competing products like Monero. And they're not they're not competing as long as long as you keep starting from the assumption that that what your what Monero can do can match the full range of functionality of public currency, we're not, we're not going to get anywhere. I, I just don't agree with that statement. If, if, if you don't believe that, then it's not a competing product. It's, it's a partial com competitor at best. But yeah, it's not actually I competing. I, mean, I obviously disagree. I disagree. Yeah. yeah. But um, that, that to me is the big question. If you, if you can see a world in which Monero stays decentralized, but is also doing all of the integrated parts of public finance that we currently have, I, I, that to me is, I think, where we, we, we differ. Because I don't, I don't think there's a world where that happens. I think the reason that Monero exists the way that it does now is precisely because it isn't doing that other stuff. What direction do you think regulation is going to move in? Uh, in, in? Let's talk about the United States. Um, with regard to cryptocurrency and in particular Monero, do you have any uh, I, I, th I think, you know, it, it, there's, there's dark clouds when it comes to sort of FATF and the, the anti money laundering and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think it's going to be really rough because I think that is one area where other actors beyond the Fed, you know, I'm not a big fan of Fed coin or CBDCs. I talk often digital fiat currency because I think it's much more important to look at something at the treasury that's explicitly political and accountable to the public through the president, but also uh, mimics cash and coins, which are historically the domain of the treasury. So I think we should be starting from thinking about the mint and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and then something there rather than a, a central bank digital currency. Um, but you know, when it, when it comes to the, the pretending future, it's, it's the spooks and the cops that, that I think, you know, whatever other question is being debated right now, they are trying to make sure they set the terms of the agenda before anything else. They're trying to make sure that every central banker in the room, every elected official, genuflex in the first 30 seconds. Well, of course, anything we do will have to keep existing anti-money laundering and, and, and you know KYC rules, right? That's the first thing. Well, we, we're still working things out. It's early days. We don't know what the different, you know, um, we don't know what the different uh, uh, models and things we're gonna look at. But one thing we're very sure about is that it will be compliant with AML KYC. And I think that's a very dangerous starting point and we should be really actively trying to resist that. Central banks aren't in a position to be telling policymakers that that should apply. You know, I don't agree with him on everything, but Jerry Brito over at Coin Center, you know, he wrote a piece saying there's no reason to assume that the a AML KYC rules that apply to bank accounts and to money transmitters will apply to a digital cash instrument, precisely because those other instruments implicate a third party, but cash doesn't. It's just you and the instrument, right? So when you have a third party, you lose the expectation, the reasonable expectation of privacy. It's like having a private conversation in front of somebody. So, you know, I agree with him in the sense that I think the legal framework we should be applying is cash, not, uh, not the AML KYC of bank accounts. And that to me is a very important fight, I think pretty much right now we should be yeah. we should be working on because central banks are able to sort of hide behind their political independence but that stuff's happening through treasury that's not happening through the fed agree agree so if the, if there were a you know congressional hearing talking about you know the regulation of let's say monero because of their concern that it is untraceable um, what what would be your recommendations there with, with regards to something like monero i i, I think it's fine I think I think we have had untraceable pieces of paper for hundreds of years, and I don't think we should get rid of it. And I think the reasons they give are bad. Now, I, I think that the way that we really do that is by demanding that standard for public money. And then we say, look, we can definitely get this for our own money. Of course, we should let us experiment as well. But if we, if we aren't going to trust the money that we use to literally pay our firefighters and our first responders and our, you know, school teachers, if we aren't going to trust that, do you really think we're going to win the fight on trusting some private thing done by a bunch of crypto people that most people think are scammers? No. The trust of privacy will come when we have a, a, a public system that earns it. And, and that to me is what we need to actually be demanding in those hearings. Don't get rid of, don't, don't quash Monero. Absolutely. 
protect the right to engage in anonymous financial speech, so to speak. But also make sure we have a system where that can actually be exercised by people in their daily lives. And that means the public good cash as well. Okay. Okay. So that, that's what I'd say. That's what I'd say. To them. You, know, you asked what I'd say. <laughs> no, no. I pre and I appreciate your, you know, first of all, coming on the show and all your candy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, our air conditioning is screwed here. As you can tell, I'm just slowly melting over here. I know, so same over here. Same over here, man. And, uh, but I, I, I think it's appropriate for this discussion. It's, it's, it's <laughs> nice yeah, the we're in the boiler room. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, I, I, I would love to, you know, maybe have you on again sometime in the future. I, I think it's interesting because we agree on some on some core principles. Obviously, we agree on, you know, the, the need for, for cash. Um, I guess we just disagree. I mean, I mean, yeah, and you're 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 certainly not anti Monero, and you're not saying you know let's let's ban cryptocurrency. Um, you're just saying that you think there is a, a very deep need for a central bank digital currency to exist. No, well, no, no, a public public digital currency. I don't have any love for central. Uh, uh, yeah, the terminology is a little. Yeah, yeah. No, I just want to be clear. I, you know, I, I have no interest in making this what most central bankers are talking about necessarily. So right. But you think if, if it were to, it needs to have privacy built into it. And then yeah, the, the, the yeah, difference yeah. there is I just don't trust that, that that will be achievable. I'd rather see that come from an open source project that organically gets adopted in the marketplace. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is something where it feels like we're disagreeing about something normatively, right? I don't think this is a matter of kind of like, I don't, I, I wish it wasn't the case that we could build Monero, right? It, it, it's not norms to me. This is to be about, about a positive understanding of the way that the system works. I don't, I don't think that uh, what you're describing actually achieves the thing that you're talking about. And so it, it's not, do I do I want to do this through the government or not? It's do I think it's necessary? Put put aside for my my own personal views about anything for a second. If if I'm correct, right? This is like to me, this is sort of like the climate change stuff. If the science is correct, we need a certain level of action. Anything under than that is just not serious. You can tell me why it's expensive, you can tell me why it's hard, but anything that's not actually going to achieve that goal is not a serious response to the thing if you say you believe in it. Right? When it comes to privacy and money, to me, the, the, the actual problem is not going to be solvable by trying to build something on the outside. And so it's not that I want it to be that, that way. It's that I think it is that way. I agree with you. It's why, would, why would you trust the, the government that passes the Patriot Act? Right? Why would you trust a government that wholesale spies on all of your data? But it's, it's precisely for that reason that there's no way out. There's no except through. There's no way to win that fight other than to tackle it head on. We can try to do appeasement. Oh, we're in the new world. Let, let that guy over there take over Czechoslovakia. Well, it's never going to come for us, right? You can try that kind of approach or you can stick your head in the sand and, and move to an intentional community and just not interact with anyone else outside until, until the stormtroopers come. But to me, at least, this totalitarian threat it, 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 it is only addressable through the through the center. Yeah, I, which is where I would disagree. I, you know, my and obviously we, we I think we hashed it out pretty well. But where I disagree is I think you can create, you know, uh, a technology that competes in the free market that can provide uh, those needs. Yeah, I don't think I don't think there's such thing as a free. And it market. exists. It exists. I, I don't think there's there such thing as a free market. Works. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, that's that's a whole. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm just saying it, it exists. It exists in a particular set of arrangements that that could very well be under threat very soon. And and when you say it works, like I, I know you know, I get you have to. This is your show, fine. But it it doesn't work on the things that I'm talking about. Even by your own admission, it hasn't done all of the things that a public monetary system does. You could say it could. You could say if only we got the chance, we would. Okay. Yeah, but I, I'm admitting that. Yeah, you can't. You can't print more Monero through. No, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about issuance. I'm talking about the functions. I'm talking about the integration with courts. I'm talking about the integration with contract systems. I'm talking about the integration with securities markets and existing regulatory classification. I'm talking about the right, way. I, that we, well, I, I disagree. No, I think those things can. I think we can live in a world where those. Monero gets integrated in that way into into government and into society. I, I do, I do, I do think that's possible. Okay. So, 
I mean, like we said, we, we're seeing it in El Salvador, whether or not, you know. Well, we haven't, we haven't seen it yet. Right, well, we're, well, seeing we, we're seeing the beginnings of it, right? I don't, I don't think. Well, you know, I think, I think, eighty-seven percent of people said that they don't want to use it, and there's what two ATMs on the whole country right now where you can actually cash out into cash. Right now, there is a very shady bill that was rammed through extraordinarily fast with no public conversation. Looks like it was mostly written by one company that Shock Horror is going to be responsible for a pretty big part of the infrastructure. And what's the centerpiece of the whole thing? Tether. Now, you said before you think a lot of this industry is scam. I hope you include Tether in that. Definitely. But, well, then the whole the whole Ecuadorian experiment relies on the Tether rails. Yeah, right and, and, I, and I agree with you in the fact that, you know, I don't I don't like the way it was, you know, uh, passed in, in a way that, you know, didn't use uh, proper process. Um, I, I is, agree. is this it then? Is this, is this what winning looks like? Cause that's what you no, just, it's just indicative of the fact that, you know, it is possible for governments to start to move in this direction now, you know, if you're, if you're a strong man who doesn't think through any of the problems and relies on scamming intermediaries, right? That that's the caveat that you should. Well, be that, that, that's going to be the first, that's going to be there. That is going to be your early adopter with that. Unfortunately, that's just, you know, that's just the way well, it's hi historically. I don't know how many good things started like that. I mean, maybe, maybe you disagree, but, it, but at the very least, when you say, look, we're doing it, that's what you're doing. Let's be honest. What what's being done, and we're not. People haven't wholesale switched over to Bitcoin. Uh, the country hasn't worked out any of the questions about foreign exchange rate and liquidity management of their reserves at all. They haven't worked out how to ensure this thing's going to be widely actually used. They haven't ensured that the underlying assets that people are going to be left holding, i.e., tethers, are safe. If this is if this is work doing it, it's not done. I, I don't agree that what they have done up until now is proof that it's possible. I mean, you, you can, uh, right up until the point that rocket takes off and explodes like 100 feet above Cape Canaveral, <laughs> they're building a rocket, right? You know, like it, 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 what this thing is right now is, is like a bunch of high octane fuel and some like metal rods sitting next to like a, a, a construction site and someone being like, wait till we build this rocket. Fine, maybe, but it is not proof that you can build a rocket yet. What, what is going on in El Salvador is not, at all close to ready for prime time as, as a, no, as a it, proof, just that's a proof of concept, not even, not even as a general purpose thing. It's it's not just, even, it hasn't it's, answered any of the core questions that this kind of thing needs to answer. Right. I, it's just proof that, you know, we could start to see governments move in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, I definitely agree that a strong man populist from a small island country dealing with remittance and foreign exchange dollarization issues, might be tempted by a, a scam artist to write a bill and ram it through as you know in two days i i agree with that that can happen i don't think that proves a bigger point though i don't think that i don't think that proves that there's a public out there thirsty for this there's a country that it, that has any legitimacy in how it's passing legislation that has asked for this and got it i don't think that's what we see one one last question um do you ever see a cryptocurrency competing as gl the global reserve currency? No, because the global reserve currency is intimately connected with the legal regime and with the enforcement regime of states. And that it is not a currency as a technology. It is a system of international governance. I don't like a lot of it, but I don't think that you, you replace a technology uh, you, you replace the 200 nuclear weapons across the country or the thousands of military bases and all of those things that underpin the international financial arrangement do you, uh, do with, you with, with, with the open source software. Do you think the network will continue to grow, the cryptocurrency? So obviously Bitcoin network is growing, Monero's network is growing in terms of usage. Do you think that will continue or... Oh yeah, I I, th I I don't I don't know where the bottom is going to be on subcultures that strongly believe in some of the values that underpin a lot of the crypto stuff, including hard currency, including distrust of any form of, of collective public governance, and including scamming. So I I think that that space is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Could definitely grow a lot more, but you know. There were periods of history where there were wide, you know, widely popular industries selling all kinds of things that we don't, you know, consider to be particularly valuable anymore. And I'm not sure how much of that stuff in 200 years is going to be looked back for as particularly good. Um, I, you know, the kinds of sort of innovations in financial derivatives um, that a lot of this stuff represents is the kind of stuff that's, you know, in, in a financial history book 
that that you know is is not particularly interesting even to the people that find that stuff interesting what we're seeing now is a lot of people that have convinced themselves that they're sort of freedom fighters because they are making money on crypto and that is why a lot of it's interesting if you took out the ability to keep making money like that then being a freedom fighter would suddenly feel a lot less fun and when when you when you took the, the scamming out of the, the the community it would have a very very different degree of energy and attention and I, you know, you're welcome to say you think that's a kind of you know necessary way of building. I'm, I'm, I think there are better ways to build community. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's where it's proving to work. Um, you know, obviously, I ideally people would just be running purely on this belief in you know trying to create a liberating technology, uh, but you know that's that's typically not how things work and evolve. Um, there needs well, to be they've been, they've been, incentives you know, there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm 100 motivated by the ideology, whether you want to believe me or not. No, no, I, I genuinely, I absolutely do. It's, and, and you know, for the record, I, I really do appreciate what you guys are doing. There's no reason I'm sort of giving, you know, trying to be straight with you is because I respect you. I'm not trying to condescend to you. I just, I, I care enough about what you guys are doing to disagree meaningfully with it. But I, I think the, the, the like idea that people need to. Uh, earn money is different from a valorization of greed, which is which is baked into a lot of these currencies, a lot of the the justifications for them. How could you say this thing is bad? My number's gone up. This is an accepted yeah, moral. Agree. That's an accepted moral c c case. So when you say, for example, it's succeeded, right? That it, you, the only people you're speaking to there are people that already agree with 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 the set of conditions you've defined. I don't think it's succeeded. Right? It hasn't succeeded. That's that's the problem. It it hasn't gotten beyond being a space for scammers. It hasn't gone beyond being a niche product. It hasn't gone beyond being a tool of strongman authoritarians to the extent that it's acknowledged officially at all. Like that that isn't that isn't success. It might be a path there. I I'm willing to concede that as as, as a possibility, but it's not success. And you say, well, we've already proved it can be done. You haven't. You haven't proved it can be done. You've proved these certain things that do not at all add up to it can be done to me well it's it's okay <laughs> it's happening i mean people people use monero for its per its cash like purposes today 100 percent. they're on they're on the dark web whether you agree that's a good thing or bad no, no, no. that's, that's not that's not cash's only purpose though hmm? that's not cash's that's not cash's only purpose it's it's a use case of cash Yes, I agree. They they are using it in the way that you use one use case of cash. I agree. Yeah, that's that's not the same thing though. All those other use cases are not reducible. They don't naturally follow. Right, but I, I think that's a very important use case: this ability to privately transact without censorship. Yeah, sure. Um, I agree. Where where can people where can people follow you? Learn more about you. Uh, probably just Twitter. notified when you're you're doing your next congressional hearing. Yeah, I, don't know. I have my website you can go to, but yeah, mostly Twitter. I'm also part of an organization called the Modern Money Network, Modern Money Network, which does public education around money and finance. So that's check that out. But yeah, no, just online. Would you ever consider having a Monero guest on the on that Money Network? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we we probably should have some sort of conference around digital currency at some point. I'd definitely be interested. I, I you know, as I said, I, I think you guys and you know Zcash and a few others. Are, uh, I, I try and do right things. I just think that there's a, you know, I, I had an interesting conversation with um, Peter Van Valkenburg, who is on the Zcash board about sort of the difference between public and private on their on their um, podcast, where a lot of that was about the same question. And, you know, I, I think there's an interesting tension there. And I, you know, hope you guys, I hope you guys are more right than wrong, because if that's the case, then we'll be in a better place than I think we're at. Would you would you ever consider adding a Monero donation address to your to your Twitter page? No, I don't even have a regular donation address to my Twitter page because I don't do this for money. Okay, well, just you know, just to experience Monero, to experience the power of Monero. <laughs> well, it, it would be experiencing the power of monetizing something that I'd like to keep not monetized. I think first and foremost. Okay. Fair enough. Listen, Matt. Th thank you. Thanks again. Thanks for being a sport. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. And, you know, it's a pleasure. And I, I you know, only, as I said, I hope, I hope it didn't mean anything personally. So I appreciate no, you. Coming absolutely coming. not. Absolutely not. Uh, you, you were a pleasure, man. I, I appreciate your candidness. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. 
You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.